Good morning, friends. My name is Ashutosh Garg. I work for Furnace Improvements. Our company is in the business of revamping fire heaters. Welcome to this webinar. This webinar has been born out of my experience of working on coker heaters for the past 10 years. So I'll try to share what I learned in those 10 years with you and what we think is wrong with the coker heaters. Coker heaters have been there in the industry for almost 90 years. I believe the first coker heater was built around 1930s. Uh, most of those heaters built during the earlier stages were single fire twin cell cabin heaters with a common convection section the one which you can see on the screen in the slide and around 1980s foster wheeler came up with the double fired coker heaters and soon other companies also followed the suit so double fired heater has a distinct advantage as compared to the single fired cabin heaters and that is the flexibility of online spalling so owners or operators can spall the tubes remove the coke and extend the run length of coker heaters so coker double fired coker heaters were supposed to be much better in performance as compared to single fired coker heaters and i believe around 1980s or maybe a little later almost all the coker heaters built in the industry worldwide have been double fired coker heaters coker heater is a very unique heater it starts coking from day one so the design has to be such to minimize the coking and extend the run length but the reason i'm doing this webinar today is about five years ago one of our clients built a coker heaters in fact three coker heaters almost to the tune of i believe the investment was almost about 300 million dollars for that coker heaters and the other thing and those coker heaters performance was very very poor they struggled from day one the burner vendor kept on modifying the burners for almost two years later they spent several million dollars upgrading the metallurgy of tubes from nine chrome to stainless steel 347 and despite all that they could not improve the performance of their heaters they were spalling almost 10 times a, in a year they were injecting uh, six times, I believe, six times the steam. You know, steam is supposed to reduce coking, and they were injecting six times the normal recommended uh, coke steam, steam into the coils, which led to more energy usage and higher firing rate. So they came to us about, I think, three or four years ago and when we looked at the heater we thought there is so much wrong with the coker heaters design that we need to do a webinar you know we need to talk to the end users directly and talk to them and see <clears throat> tell them what is wrong with the coker heater designs how can they be improved 
and how you can have higher run length. So that's what we are going to be discussing today. So when I started assembling the material, I found that I had so much information to share with you. I decided to do it in two parts. I thought 45 minutes will not do the justice to coker heaters, the amount of information I want to share with you. So I decided to do it in two parts. We will focus on the combustion side today. And then we will do a seminar maybe in about 60 days on the coil side or the process side because I think both sides are equally important in any heater, not only in coker heater. So we will focus on combustion today in this webinar, and then we will go over to the process side, which is equally important in coker heaters and see how you can, what's, what things can be improved on the process, you know, in coker heater. So we will, do that. Uh, we have been doing webinar after a long time, maybe about a year gap. Uh, and every time we have done webinar, we have talked to our participants, we have heard from them. We have, every time we have learned something new. Our audience has been kind enough to share their experiences because you are working in the field 24 seven with your heaters. I am a paper engineer, you know, I only work on paper and computer. So you have been kind enough sharing your experiences and please continue sharing your concerns. And I assure you, we will try to answer every query which we receive during these webinars. So uh, we have designed this presentation today on PowerPoint. And uh, please feel free to send me any questions. I will start the session like I have started almost all my sessions with a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer from IIT Kanpur. I passed out in 1974. Uh, I, since 1976, I've been working on fired heaters. I worked with KT India and Engineers India. And then in 1990, I moved to US where I worked for KTI Corporation. Uh, since 1996, I have been working for furnace improvements. And uh, we've been working with our clients directly and solving heater problems, revamping heaters, improving these performances. So uh, that's my introduction. Uh, and the reason we are doing this webinar today is that story is told in this graph. This is an actual graph and you can see how fast these temperatures are rising. It's almost like five, six degree F per day. That's how fast these temperatures are rising. And you can also see a gap. That means the client had to take a shutdown and then, you know, uh, decoke the furnace or pick the furnace and then again restart. So, uh, that's what we want to talk to you and see how you can improve your existing coker heaters. Or if you are going to be building new coker heaters, what factors you can take care during design to improve the performance of these coker heaters. Uh, 
Before I start on cooker heaters, I want to talk for a few minutes about our company because that they are paying my bill. My team has worked on this proposals or on this webinar, on this presentation. So furnace improvement started in 1996. We have got two offices. Our head office is in Sugarland, Texas. And our main engineering office, that's where we do all our activities now, is in Noida, India. We opened that office in 2005. And our mission has been to improve the performance of existing fire heaters. Uh, this is something which I found out in early 90s that there was no company in US which was taking care of existing fire heaters. So I thought, why not start working on existing fire heaters? All the heater vendors were focused on supplying newer, new fire heaters to the for new projects. So I took on this mission of working with directly with the owners and end users and provide them with our value added solutions. Uh, we have been pretty successful. Uh, we have a contrarian approach because when you're working with existing heaters, you have a challenge all the time to see what's wrong, why this heater is not working. So by having a contrarian approach, we are able to find out the deficiencies in the existing designs. Uh, we are able to do round the clock work. We are able to keep schedules. And our philosophy is do it once, do it right. So we don't uh, believe in reworking and we think do it once, do it right is the most economical way of executing projects. Uh, we are a full service company. We have a team of 40 engineers in Noida. And uh, our main strength lies in process design. I have a team of nine process engineers in Noida. And that's where we do the process design, data sheets. We also is one of the few heater companies which has its own CFD modeling group. So we think people who we who work on heat or CFD all the time can produce better designs and uh, they work with our process group all the time. We are also having our 3D modeling group and we may be the only heater company which does its own fabrication drawings. So by doing that, we are able to execute projects in a very, very short time. Uh, we have supplied heaters in about six months. We have done several projects where we are able to do the project in no more than 120 days. So uh, that's what our strengths are, our team is. Uh, this is a list of our clients. We have worked with Philips, Citco, Delec, Valero, uh, Chevron, Marathon, Countrymark, Frontier, <clears throat> We have done work for Total. We have in India. We have done work for HPCL, uh, Thermax, and Middle East. We have done work for KNPC, Qatar Gas. So we have a, a clients almost all over the world. Our agenda today is going to be focused on coker heaters. Talk about run length talk about design parameters, and then I'm going to be presenting two case studies to you, one single fired and one double fired. So uh, any heat refinery you go, you will have anywhere between 15 to 60 heaters, depending on the complexity of the refinery. But in our industry, we call four heaters the major building blocks. 
the crude heater that's the heater where the crude is heated the first time and atmospheric distillation is carried out then we have vacuum heater where vacuum distillation takes <clears throat> takes on and then all the residue from atmospheric vacuum and all the other units hydrocracker and diesel all those residues are sent to the coker heater and that's where the valuable products are extracted and the residue is converted into coke which is then sent to uh, different industries for rubber aluminium power plants for burning and the fourth heater which is called which is catalytic reformer heater that's the fourth heater where the octane number of the gasoline is improved that's a reformer heater so these are the four major heaters we have in most of the refineries and today our focus is on coker heaters so the objective of coker heaters or coker unit is to take all the residue and convert it into higher value products like gasoline diesel fuel lpg and the residue is called petroleum coke in this heater we try to heat the charge rapidly that means we try to have uh, high velocities and this is uh, one of the critical heaters in the industry and by critical what we mean is there is some reaction taking place so six percent cracking per pass takes place and delayed coking is an endothermic reaction and heater is basically supplying the heat and as the name suggests it's a coker heater so the coking starts from day one as a result a uh, pressure drop goes up and uh, the two metal temperature goes up so those are the two signs of uh, coking in tubes my experience uh, has been that two metal temperature goes up much faster in these coker heaters than the pressure drop i have not seen many heaters where i could see the pressure drop indication or pressure drop limitation and we will talk more about this that how uh, it's a two metal temperature which uh, is controlling these days for the coker heaters we do have an injection of boiler feed water to minimize cracking and the rate of coke deposition basically determines the heater run length now i'll be talking more about design of coker heaters and i know most of you are in the operation of coker heaters so please bear with me i want you to be familiar with the design because uh, like any equipment once the heater is built there is not much you can do you know most of the clients end up retubing their heaters upgrading the metallurgy you know to from nine chrome to stainless steel 347 we will talk more about in the next webinar but what needs to be done is when you are building a coker heater you can do a lot of things at very minimal cost to improve the performance of these coker heaters there are four parties which are involved in coker heater design or building of coker heaters the first is the licensor where basically i believe there are only three or four companies in the whole world which have the coking technology then comes the epc the company which is doing the project then comes the heater vendor which is supplying the heater as per the epc and the guidelines set by the coker licensor and in the last it's you the owner so basically these are the four uh, team of four companies or four people who are responsible for 
designing or building of coker heaters and uh, why are we having all these problems in the coker heaters today you know so i see that experience is missing in most of the companies and that's true of everywhere everywhere the experience is missing whether it is the end user whether it is a heater company whether it is the licensor epc you see the experienced people have either left the industry or have retired you know and the second reason is computerization actually i mean computerization is good and bad actually it's good because we can now design the heater i mean maybe one day you know but it is bad because people don't get a feel of what they are designing you know because running a computer program is not the same as running a heater in the field actually the computer program does not predict flame impingement you know the computer program does not predict coking actually so does not predict the run length of the coker heater so there are a lot of limitations in the computer programs so these are some of the things which have changed there is another uh, big change which i can talk now and that is the change in burners when the coker heaters first started we were using premix burners and today we are using ultra low nox burners so there is a big change in the burners or the combustion characteristics of these burners and we will talk more about them but those things even though we have had changes in the burners there was no change in the design methodology of these heaters which is very surprising that the flame became four times the original burner flames but the designer the heater designer thought it will still be fine actually so a uh, lot of things need to be fixed and one of the issues which i have seen in these heaters is everybody is under cost pressure including us all the time uh, our industry is in the survival mode it is not a growth industry like it so everybody right from the project manager of the client to the epc to want to cut the cost and the finally it is the heater vendor who has to bear the brunt you know he is under the pressure and what ends up you happening is cutting corners at wrong places i'm not saying you cut corners but you cut corners at the right places rather than at the wrong places so when you cut corners at the wrong places you end up affecting the run length of the heater you end up with issues like flame impingements you end up issue like high to metal temperatures and uh, that's what happens so maybe for the same money if you would have cut corners at the right places you would have gotten a much more reliable heater it's not necessary to spend more money but it is important to spend a cut at the right corners you know all right so let's move on uh, i'm running getting limited by the time uh, so coker heater design parameters the inlet temperature around 400 to 600 degrees generally on the higher side outlet temperature between 930 is the typical temperature range pressure drop around 300 psi uh, steam injection or boiler feed water injection about 1% of the heater feed average flux rate 9000 for the single fired 12000 or 13000 for the 
this thing. Mass velocity range is around 350 to 550 and cold dull velocity around greater than six feet per second. Well, let's look at the construction of two heaters. Uh, I've got single fired or double fired. As you can see in single fired, the tubes are on the sides and burners are in the center. In the double fired, tubes are in the center and burners are on the sides. So definitely when you have double fired, you have uniform heating of tubes. Because we use higher heat flux, we are able to reduce the coil length, which is good. We reduce the residence time. We have lower pressure drop, lower residence time. So all these things are good. But what's been the user experience is that despite all these advantages, I'm not able to realize those benefits. So that's what we want to find out what happened. All those benefits which were touted, why didn't we get realized? So I'm giving you another uh, actual example of uh, a double fired coker heater. This is a coker heater with tubes in the center. First of all, there is a bridge wall in the center to make it from one cell into two cells. Then we have tubes, horizontal tubes in the center and burners on both the sides. Uh, we have four inch tubes to start with and then, then the owner put five inch tubes at the at the 3D pitch. So this is typical construction. Uh, one thing I do want to tell you, almost all coker heaters have horizontal tubes. And generally in double fat coker heaters, each cell has one pass so that you can do the online spalling, you know, at any time or decoking at any, picking at any time. Uh, we already covered this. Uh, what we did was we had access to about 40 heaters during our last 30 years of uh, this thing. So we made a database and we came up with some of these uh, averages to tell you what uh, has been the difference parameters on design. So this is uh, for the average flux and the maximum flux and these are the ranges what we found in the industry you know uh, we'll cover more but one of the features of coker heaters is having lots of burners and we found that average number of burners in some of these heaters was around 60 and 3 million BTU each, burner to tube spacing, burner to burner spacing. We will talk more about these critical parameters. You know, but range has been all over the place. So uh, I have put together a tube metal temperature calculation. I don't know how many of you want to deal with it or look at it, but some of the parameters what goes into the tube metal temperature are average heat transfer coefficient. Basically the coke thickness we assume about quarter inch came up with the average heat transfer coefficient. And the maximum heat flux fluid temperature at the outlet, then we find the delta T across the film, delta T across the metal and that gives us our tube metal temperature clean tube metal temperature or start of run tube metal temperature and on the second column we have the end of run tube metal temperature and we have almost like 180 degrees f coking allowance and the end of run temperature is about 1255 so we have approximately 200 degrees uh, give and take you know for the tube metal temperature uh, now, many of our clients have gone up in metallurgy and gone to stainless steel 347. So what it does is once you go to 347, you can bump this up from 1255 to almost like 1400 or 1450, you know, 
So you get 400 degrees uh, between the run lengths. So it does extend the run length, but stainless steel has lower emissivity, has much higher cost. So you pay for all those, you know. So this is the run length comparison. I'm starting with 1080, finishing at 1500 for uh, SS347 and 1300 for P9. So I can get different run lengths, you know, depending on or the how much temperature increase I'm experiencing every day. This is I can if I have to use P9, then I have to limit 0. 0.6 degree per day to meet one year run length. If I'm using stainless steel 347, I can afford to go to double the run length, I mean double the rate. So it does give me a lot more uh, uh, flexibility, but then again, you are bearing the cost, you know. You are not solving the root cause problem. You are exp uh, just solving the end of run temperature. So this is uh, with two degrees, you know, from 1082 to 1255, basically about 90 days you can get, you know, DMT. So the so the trick is how to limit the two metal temperature increase per day. And basically, uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, two coker heaters. One is a single fired coker heater, as you can see over here. Uh, this was a twin cell construction, natural draft with a central bridge wall, four passes, two passes in each cell. And the convection had process, steam generation, you know, and the stack on top. So that's basically how this heater was. And when we talk to the client, The clients told us that they are decoking every year. The tube life is only five to six years. Longer flame lengths, you know. And what they said was the heater has been have been having imbalanced firing, like the outer cells are required to fire almost 30% higher than the inner cells. Uh, to get the same outlet temperature. So the heater had a firing imbalance for almost like 30 years. That's how long they had been living with this problem. So we took on this project and uh, I do want to tell you something which has happened in the last 30 years is the development of CFD computational fluid dynamics. It is a very powerful tool to analyze fired heaters. I mean, it is used worldwide in so many applications, including automobile designs. But here we found out that it is a very useful tool to analyze the fired heaters. Look at the flames. It has to be done properly, but it will give you a lot of insight as to what is happening with your burners, what is happening with your flue gas temperature, what is happening with your tube metal temperatures, why you are experiencing high tube metal temperatures on some particular tubes and not others. So uh, what we did was we ended up ended up doing CFD on this heater actually, and you can see over here, uh, this is where the combust uh, convection section was connected and the flu flame had a tendency to go towards here. So this cell had to be fired about 30% harder. And when we did CFD, we realized that that was true actually. Uh, had never thought about it before. Uh, we took up this problem and we always thought that the way these heaters are designed, the passes are symmetrical and the 
heaters are symmetrical, but when you do the CFD, you realize that things are not the way it, they intended to be. So you can see the high tube metal temperature on the inner side and outer side are much cooler actually for the same level of firing. So it did tell us that there is a firing imbalance. And you can see even the flue gas temperature around the tubes is much higher on the inner side than on the outer side. And that's what was causing the extra firing, you know. So we came up with a new design. The client was going to be retubing it in kind. We said, okay, hold on, and we will come up with a new design of the radiant coil. We moved the roof tubes up because they were having uh, flame impingement and tube failures on those shock tubes. And we designed this and uh, implemented it. The results were spectacular. I'm just showing you the CFD issues that this is the existing, this is the proposed, and then we also came up with the baffle design to ensure that the hot tubes don't experience the hot flue gases. So these are just showing the CFD. Uh, CFD is a very powerful tool, but it has to be done very carefully. So this is, you can see the existing heater CFD. This was a proposed case where we raised the tubes up. And this is the one where we added this baffle over here to ensure that there is more clearance between the flue gases, hot flue gases and the hot tubes. So we did this and the results were very good. We were able to reduce that heat flux from 18,000 to around 14,000, almost 25% reduction. So uh, we were able to solve this problem actually. Uh, so our approach is to look into the details, you know, and I will cover in as many details as possible. This is the double fired heater example. As I said, client put two new coker heaters issues from day one. Uh, several burner modifications upgraded the tube to SS347H. And these were two identical heaters. Each heater had three cells with two passes each. And this is, are the design parameters of this heater. So this was the construction of these heaters, you know, two cells and three rows of burners. This is the convection section. We are not talking of convection section at this time. We will cover it in the next one. This is the burner layout. This is the floor layout, uh, basically the tubes and burners on both the sides. So this heater was having lots of problems, lots and lots of problems. And uh, we looked at the burners and we did the CFD and they were not running the furnace at 100% load and the heaters were spalled 10 times. So one thing which I want to talk to you is, in heaters, there are two sides, the process side and the combustion side, and they need to be married together, you know. They need to be made for each other. And similarly, the burners and the heaters needs to be need to be made for each other you know if you don't if you look at the burners and if you know the flames are going to be long you need to take care of that during the design you know uh, those flames will not disappear those flames will not go anywhere but they will end up impinging on your tubes and raising the tube metal temperatures you know so uh, 
it's very very important that we look at the burners we look at the heaters we look at all the parameters and as i said nowadays there is a very good tool available which is called cfd that can predict all these issues you know so these are some more details on that heater uh, what we want to talk about today is uh, all the heaters whether it's a single fired heater whether it's a double fired heater are designed using lobo evans a paper written by two brilliant engineers walter lobo and len evans in 1940s it's almost going to be 100 years shortly in about another 15 years and that was based on the assumption that there is a uniform flue gas temperature in the firebox this is a very unique case where we know that uniform flue gas temperature in firebox does not exist and yet we are using that assumption to design our fire heaters so it's a kind of a cash 22 situation that when they designed at that time the burner flames used to be very small premix burners a lot of burners were used so as to have a very uniform heat transfer and a continuous stirred tank reactor model you know that was the assumption by lobo and evans we continue to use their method but we don't follow their recommendations you know we don't have short flames in the burner we don't have uniform flue gas temperature in the firebox we don't have a cstr model and what you need to do is to look at your heaters look at the go and get cfd done look at the heat transfer pattern or and where you are getting hot spots and then fix it so three parameters which come to my mind are the number of burners burner to burner distance and burner to tube distance these are the three parameters which need to be reviewed need to be improved and they can fix your fire heaters we do have a inclined firing technology which you can use we can evaluate it for your heaters or coker heaters and see whether we can move the flames away the trick is to move the flames away from the tube there is no other magic uh, we can do in these heaters so if you move the flames away you will be able to get a much better performance you know uh, the firebox temperature in most of the coker heaters is about 1600 degree f or 800 900 degree centigrade now when you look at the temperature of the flame the temperature of flame is 3200 or 2000 degree f or 2000 degree c so those high temperatures flue gases can increase the heat transfer at a very very high rate and can coke up your heater in no time uh stefan boltzmann equation says the flux or heat transferred is proportional to the absolute temperature raised to the power 4 so if you have high tube metal temperature or high flux high flue gas temperature you will get high ra radiation you know and our team has done a lot of uh cfd modeling and they have shown that if we increase the distance between the burner and tubes you will get bit much better results you know 
So if you have a heater which is having problems, come to us, we will try to help you out. We'll try to improve the performance of your heater, just like what we have done to other clients. We can help you as well. Uh, thank you very much. We will get back to you. Uh, and what I will do is I will look, I don't, I'm running out of time. So I will take your questions, answer them, and send it to all of you in a PDF document. We have your emails. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And as always, take care. Bye. So I do have a question, uh, received, should shielded thermocouples be covered with insulation? I am not capable of answering this question. I will ans ask my team and get back to you. Uh, friends, thank you very much. And we hope to cover uh, the process side in the second part of our webinar. Bye.